Curved horns help these goats push away the tall grass. When food is scarce, tails filled with fat help these sheep survive. The extra skin on this bull's neck helps it stay cool in the heat. His shiny coat reflects the hot sunlight. These donkeys can digest food with very little water. These are genetic traits, evolved over the centuries as these animals adapted to survive the hostile environment of this region. Not only have individual farmers benefited from their animals' ability to survive, the entire region has benefited in terms of reliable agricultural production. Every day, Lister Mlewa faces the same problem. He must find grass for the animals he tends. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. He passes his time by making music. He offers us his music to be the soundtrack for this video. As we listen, we'll meet other farmers and hear their stories. These are the farmers of southern Africa who all rely on animals. These farmers recognize that their best hope for the future is with indigenous animals, local animals that have already survived in this region for thousands of years and will continue to survive and to provide benefits to the farmers who need them. Zebediah Mkiwa is one of those farmers. The rains came late in central Tanzania this year. His crops have failed. But it's not a total disaster. Because he has his cattle. His herd includes a local breed called Mpwapwa. During a drought several years ago, when most improved cattle in this region died, the Mpwapwa survived. So he's added them to his herd and knows they will see him through the tough times. I plan to use these cattle because I can sell one or two of them. Then I can use the money from the sale to buy the food I need to feed my family. There is a bit of irony here. Yes, the Mpwapwa will help Mr. Mkiwa and his family survive. But the breed itself is at risk of extinction. And the fate of the Mpwapwa is not unique. Across the region, many other breeds of indigenous farm animals face similar futures. Southern Africa is a land of harsh climates, of depleted natural resources. From flat grasslands to rocky and mountainous regions, the environment is in control here. Droughts are common there's a shortage of water and of grass. That's one of the advantages of the indigenous animals. They require less food because their body size is small. But it's exactly because of that small size that in the past they were not appreciated by commercial operators and governments began cross-breeding programs with larger exotic animals, trying to increase size and thus bring more money at the market. But as those kilos were added, the genetic traits that allowed the animals to survive here were being lost to the cross-breeding. It was a big price to pay. At this agricultural research station in Zimbabwe, they're trying to stop this loss of biodiversity, building herds of indigenous Thule and Nguni cattle. Dr. Sibunizio Moyo is the station director. She's convinced that indigenous livestock is the only solution for local farmers. You can fit them into a smallholder rural setup. You can use them as female uh, in a large-scale commercial setup, and they will give you the answer to higher productivity, higher survival of progeny, and uh, resistance to some diseases. It is a brown. 
James Schlebanga is nearly 80. His family has always lived in this part of southwest Zimbabwe and kept herds of the indigenous Nguni cattle. But several years ago, he joined a government breeding program, crossbreeding his Nguni with exotic cattle. Did it work? It helped at the beginning, but a big drought came and they all died. I had to start over. Eventually, I only want to have Nguni again. I think they'll bring my herd up. Animal genetics research is now underway in the 14 countries that make up the South African Development Community, or SADC. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the UN Development Program are working with SADC to survey and support research into the genetic traits and assets of local farm animals. This regional survey will give governments and international organizations more information about the contributions of these animals and about those that are endangered. Another SADC activity, the Integrated Project for Food Security, supported by the government of Norway, is also working to raise awareness of the importance of these local animals. Dr. James Msechu is an animal geneticist representing the SADC program in Tanzania. He feels that these animals can be considered a renewable natural resource. They're a vital component of the region's biodiversity. One major important uh, aspect of uh, the genetic resources would be uh, an effort to try and re reverse the trend of those animals which are endangered. Uh, there are some animals which are now running towards extinction very fast, and we want to reverse that. The Himba tribe has lived for centuries here in northwest Namibia, isolated from scientific advances and modern conveniences in an environment that from the outside appears to have very little to offer. Yet they have survived and achieved a high level of health for both themselves and their animals. That's one of the reasons the government decided to include the Himba in its research, to learn how the Himba have managed so successfully in these conditions. Their lives are simple. Their traditions are strong. Their animals are central to their lives. The women color their skin with a mixture of animal fat and red ochre. They milk the cattle each morning. The unmarried men of the village also have responsibility for milking. The women churn the milk. They preserve the butter with an herb similar to garlic. They use the dung from the animals to build their houses. Their clothing is made from the animal skins. Women build the fences that protect the animals. Children help with the sheep and goats. Decisions about the management of the animals are made by the men. It's all very organized and it's successful, according to Julius Kachimune, who is an agricultural researcher with the SADC program in Namibia. He's come to learn from Andreas Mutambo and the people in his village. Mostly there are two problems in this region, grazing and water. So Himbas move where there is grazing and water. So they, this is one aspect of their management. They move where there is water and grazing. That's what keeps their livestock mostly in, in good shape. Mr. Mutambo keeps two herds of cattle. There is one of crossbreds. This bull has a Sangha mother. Sangha is the indigenous animal, but a Brahmin father. 
The other herd is of pure Sangha. The larger crossbreds will earn him more money in the market, but he recognizes that the Sangha is a better type for his sparse environment, and he keeps the Sangha as insurance for the future. Timo Bredenhan is a commercial farmer in Namibia who reached the same conclusions. He farms 5,000 hectares but only has 450 cattle. That's all the land can support because of lack of rain and grass. He says that the European influence in farming in this area for the last century has not been good. We didn't bring in better cattle. The better animals were already here, like the Damara sheep and the Sangha. They were so adapted to this country. There was no necessity for bringing exotics. Although he experiments with crosses of Sangha and brown Swiss, which he thinks could lead to better milk or meat production, he relies on his pure Sangha. Throughout the Sadik region, government research stations, universities and international organizations are building indigenous herds and studying their genetic makeup, always with the goal of increasing food production. Especially in Africa where population growth is uh, actually not in direct proportion with the amount of food produced. Which the sheep and we have the, the goat. Okay. Yeah. So these bands, uh, Professor Paul Guakisa is chairman of the National Advisory Committee of the SADC program in Tanzania. He's studying the resistance of some local chickens to typhoid. With the hope to find genetic markers which can be linked with the in traits of interest, say disease resistance or production traits. And hopefully if we come to markers which are associated with these economically important traits, we could exploit them to enhance production of not only the local chickens, but also maybe of exotic chickens under our tropical conditions. Other animals are being studied for their resistance to other diseases, diseases caused by ticks or resistance to internal parasites. This resistance has the potential to help not only local farmers, but farmers in other parts of the world to force it into the curriculum because we thought it was really stupid in a country where we have so many donkeys we should have in our syllabus. Dr. Ali Aboud calls himself an evangelist and his message focuses on an animal he considers an unsung hero of Southern Africa, the donkey. Indigenous donkeys that roam the countryside, often unappreciated by local people, until Dr. Aboud came along. A donkey is usually left around to, 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 to fend on leftovers from other animals. And at times it is almost treated like a vermin. Yeah, and I was very concerned about this. I thought we need to, to have a change in this. We, we must change opinion on it. Dr. Aboud was horrified by the way the donkey's potential was being ignored. Their comparative pulling power is more than double that of cattle. He started a program to introduce donkeys to local farmers, starting with women farmers because in Africa, donkeys and women do the same kind of work. They know uh, how much a donkey works for them, and in the absence of a donkey, they become the donkeys. I had the training. Now I use the donkeys for carrying water and for weeding. It means I have more time with my children. The training has now expanded to include men. For Leonard Kigali, donkey power has meant significant financial savings. I used to hire other people to cultivate my land and take my crops to the market. Now I cultivate all eight acres with one pair of donkeys and I take my crops to the market myself with the donkey. Since the training began, the price of donkeys has tripled in this area, and the average amount of land under cultivation has increased. Once again, the conclusion of scientific research is the same as farmers' own experience in the field. Indigenous animals are an enormous asset to this region, 
They are a vital natural resource. They need to be respected for what they have to offer. And they need to be protected and further developed for the future.